Hello, listeners. Welcome to episode number 11 of How Do You Write? I'm your host, Rachel Heron, and I am very glad that you're listening again this week. It's nice to talk to you. Um, Just a little catch up before we get into our interview with Kim Worker, who is just one of my favorite people. And it's a good thing that we don't live close to each other because I think we would spend time together and maybe get less done. Or she is just that dynamic, you will see. Uh, We might get more done and that would actually be scary. So um, in my writing world, the writing is flowing. I am about 40,000 words into the Songbird's Home, the third book in the Darling Songbird series. And it's just it's just working. It's it's like I've said before, it's just scaring me that this first draft is coming so easily, but um maybe that has something to do with plotting and the fact that I've done some. So for me that helps. Um not for everybody. In exciting news, I got a class accepted to Berkeley. Um I pitch them classes. I pitch Berkeley and Stanford classes, and sometimes they take me up on them, and sometimes they don't. But Berkeley accepted How to Write a Romance. It's going to be a 10-week course in the spring, and I am just pretty damn thrilled to be bringing it to Berkeley. Um, It's the extension. You know, it's Berkeley light, I like to say. Uh, But it's still Berkeley, and there will be romance taught within its walls at Cal. So go Bears. Um, That's super exciting. Also, in financial news, I started um, formatting the interiors of print books, which is something that I found that I really, really like to do. Uh, I do it for my own books, for my self-published books. Um, Word is not always nice to play with. It is notoriously difficult, in fact, to get things right. But I just kind of speak the language. So I'm doing bargain interiors for print books. Anybody who's got an ebook and want to convert it into a print book, come to me. Um, yeah, that's available at rachelheron.com backslash format. So I think I've just been kind of busy on a lot of different fronts and having a great time. And we will now jump right into the episode. And please enjoy my silly, giddy, and a little bit long, but absolutely worth it chat with my friend Kim Worker. All right, welcome listeners. I'm so pleased to present my friend Kim Worker, who is incredibly inspiring to me. I'm so glad that you're here today, Kim. I'm so excited to be here. My whole face is crunched up. I felt like I can't say my words properly. (laughs) Just let me give a little bio of you, which is uh, incomplete because you are such a busy, dynamic person. Kim Worker is a writer and freelance editor who tries to make something, anything, every day. Many of those things are awful and some are not. She runs a project, which I love, called Mighty Ugly, leading workshops and lecture conversations to help people embrace the hard parts of creativity so they can have more fun making stuff and trying new things. Her latest book is Make It Mighty Ugly, Exercises and Advice for Getting Creative Even When It Ain't Pretty. She has also written six crochet books and recently helped a client start a clarinet magazine. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, Kim lives in Vancouver, BC with her partner, their son, and their butt. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like, and their butt. <laughs> She's just a fourteen-year-old dog. <laughs> That's awesome. I was like, I was even watching your face when you said it, and in my mind, I heard and their butt. And their butt. <laughs> well, there are butts. There's a bunch of butts there. It's no? true. We, we all we all have one. We've already devolved, people. Already devolved. Sorry, I know. I, like, I can't even. It's been a week. This is why it's fun to have my writing friends on the show too. So this is great. Let's hop into your process um, and start talking about that. What is the best time of day for you to write, and where do you write? Um, all uh, any or all times, also everywhere. Um, so I don't, uh, you, uh, you just almost totally did a I know, spit take. Spit take. <laughs> um, she was like, darn it, Kim, have an answer. So the answer is, okay, so I can, I can narrow that down a little bit. Usually not at night. Um, often in the morning, sometimes before coffee, which I can't, I can't explain why that works. No, it it me, works for me too. Really? It's, it's like the brain is still a little bit dreamy. That's when I that's when I plot a lot of things. Oh. I don't really write without coffee, but I do sit at the at the desk and plot. 
Oh, see, yeah. I don't, I don't plot. I like sit down. I do the full like. Wow. Maybe it might be because there's an urgency about it. So I, I do have a tendency. Half of my best work is done when I'm super angry, <laughs> and half of my best work is done when I, I feel like. I'm on borrowed time. Like I'm, I, you know, like I found 20 bucks on the street and what am I going to buy with it? Sort of like I'll do the other half of my best work when I could be doing something else, but I'm not. So I'm making the most of it. Shh, don't tell anyone. And like, I don't know, like before I have coffee, it's like, oh my gosh, am I going to get away with it? Like, and usually, I mean, to my own credit, it's not horrible what I do. And I prefer revising and editing anyway. Me so too. as long as I dump it out. Yeah. Who cares if, it's, you know, if it needs a lot of work after the fact? So I do it before coffee. I get a long way from um, writing until I really have to go pee. Like I will write <laughs> right up to the edge. I'm like, I've got, I can get five more minutes out. And you do write faster. You write harder. You write with more intention. <laughs> true. It's true. You know what? True story. I used to intentionally not pee before taking standardized tests when I was in school because I found them so boring and tedious that like if I had to pee I did it faster I was more focused I was more dedicated and like I, it's it's frankly it's a strategy I've kept with me all these years <laughs> okay now I've actually got tears in my eyes <laughs> Okay, now tell me, tell me from peeing, and how do you write? Do you write longhand, computer? Mm. Uh, both. So um, I was, I loved that you sent me sort of questions ahead of time. I was like, I hope I have answers to some of them. <laughs> and, and so I actually wrote these down lest I forget what my tools are because I would totally do that. <laughs> um, so a number one tool is Scrivener. Yeah. And uh, if I were a fiction writer, I imagine that Scrivener would make me intensely happy. But as a nonfiction writer, I can like enumerate the ways, right? Sort of drag and drop of, of ideas, keeping like folders of the research can be in there. Service. Notes, you know, for Make It Mighty Ugly, I interviewed people and I had every interview in Scrivener. And so oh. I was bouncing around for places. I was highlighting things. I was like cutting them dumping them into a new interview file. I mean, I ended up wanting to kill myself in the end because I had like <laughs> seven or eight instances of every... Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it turned into a big beastly mess, but but Scrivener, and then that you like press a button and it kind of spits it out in a way that you can share with other people. I can't... I know that I'm I'm almost a cliche. I'm a writer and I love Scrivener, but that's... It's funny a though. I usually hear it from the fiction writers, not the nonfiction writers. The nonfiction people a lot of times have not found Scrivener. Think They think it's a noveling piece of software, Whereas it's just for everything. I use it. I use it for my classes. Yeah. As I as I'm doing class plans, as I think of things, I'm throwing in different pieces of things. Yeah. yeah. It's it's nonfiction writers out there. It is. It's ace. I wonder if it's interesting. I guess I guess I must have found out about it because I follow a lot of fiction writers yeah. online. Um, but it's. I mean, all of the things that it gives you for fiction writing, it gives you for nonfiction. I mean, I delete the sections for characters. Me you too. know, and yep. like. Okay, but I would do that probably if I were a fiction writer just because I, I don't like following the rules. <laughs> right? like, That's exactly why I erase that. I never use those. I'm not going to go fill in their eye color on the form that they gave me. <laughs> but I could. You but... could. It's there for you if you want it. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. No, I love Scrivener. Scrivener is the best, and it's the best because I don't like to follow rules, and yet everything that I ever want to do is there. When I want an outline... I can have one when I want like an index card and move things around. But if I just want simple, it's just, it's everything. And it's one of the few things I've ever encountered that is everything and everything good. Like it's just, there's no weak part. That makes me happy to hear. Oh, uh, good. I'm a scrimmager girl. What else? Uh, Evernote occasionally. So when I write shorter pieces, mm -hmm. uh, especially for drafting, for whatever reason I do, I know it's, Evernote supports rich text, but I do plain text, Evernote, dump things in if I'm writing especially you know anything under like 2,000 words for whatever reason because I'm not gonna I guess because I'm not gonna have it in chunks that I'll move around mm -hmm. I just wanna dump it out and then I'll move it into like pages I'm a Mac person so yeah. I'll, I'll dump it into pages and make it pretty for my editor then okay. um, and then so here's the kicker in the long form when I'm stuck yellow legal pad college ruled pencil <laughs> it is it has to be yellow and legal it doesn't yeah. have to be. And in fact, I was realizing, so I don't know. I mean, you can't even see because of the crafty angle of my webcam right now. But my studio is a wreck. I don't think I have a yellow pad in here right now. And, and to, like preparing for this made me realize that like I'm hooped. If I, if inspiration strikes, I'd like, I've got to go get one. 
but I do not like wide ruled anything, and 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 that's related to why I like a pencil. It's yes, it c- constrains by the friction of a pencil but, keeps my handwriting from going bonkers. I use and, sharp writers. Oh, I just, I, just love, I mean, they're they're a, a literally a dime a dozen or whatever, but I just can't get away from them. I can't no. quit them. Right. And I like the straight up like pencil, and I've got right here You're my pencil sharpener. sharpener. I do prefer them sharp. Uh, and <laughs> like weird. So yeah. And so that's also my best offline um, strategy for writing is like screw it all. <laughs> like I close everything down and like sit and write on paper, and then that's my my best stream of consciousness writing. Um, and then in the process of typing it up. I make it like 150 times better and then oh, I go. I love that. I love that. That's the, that's the insta edit that you don't even have to think about. As you type, you realize, I don't know why I was saying those words. I don't even talk like that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Totally. Totally. What is the worst writing advice you've ever been given? I'm going to show you right here. See this smudge? There's yes. a smudge yeah, like right here on this paper. Yeah. That's where I was going to answer that question was like, and then I, I don't. I don't think I've ever been given writing advice. Good. I have read a ton of writing advice. And then I started thinking, Kim, why have you never been given writing advice? And I think it's because I didn't walk around calling myself a writer Ah. for a really long time. So people have given me advice on a whole host of things. I've gotten advice about like how to conceive a baby. I've gotten advice on like how not to be so loud at parties. I've gotten advice about like all sorts of things. but. But I don't think I walked around like I was never a kid who was like, I want to be a writer when I grow up. And so people never gave me advice. And when I was in school, I wasn't studying anything. I wasn't even studying English literature. I wasn't it was yeah. like, so it, it wasn't, you know, I do remember one eighth grade paper. My, my English teacher, he was a piece of work, that guy. And I just remember like, he was somebody who was never told to like shield the young egos oh, of no. like, pre-adolescent students and so he was just like I could just picture him like with a glass of like cheap whiskey and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth next to like three empty cups of coffee just like scrawling with his red pen over our like age 13 oh. essays and there was one essay that was full of like margin comments that said awk like A-W-K was like awkward and verb for verbose and so it was like here his voice in my head going like you're using too many words and I I actually frankly think that's probably very true so that (laughs) you have to use too many words if you're going to write books period I mean books are really long (laughs) they're so long (laughs) you need a lot of words I don't know I mean this is a guy too he made us read like in uh what was it called not into the woods oh my god that's a horrifically embarrassing thing (laughs) Jack London Jack London oh you know what I mean? Call of no, Call of the Wild. It is yeah, Call of the yeah, Wild. Yeah. Okay. And because now I'm thinking into the woods and I'm like thinking there's a wolf. It's not <laughs> anyway. So I and my experience of that book when I was in grade eight, list taking it writing advice from this guy, he loved this book, was that it was one, very boring, and two, enough about how cold it is. Holy crap. And I grew into a writer who likes to use repetition as a device. <laughs> But dude, and so wow! Apparently, everything I, that drives me to write, I learned in eighth grade and didn't from, know it till you asked from me. From that, from that guy who is <laughs> undoubtedly dead now. So, <laughs> like, a, he's the ghost in the back of your office right now, <laughs> and he's this like cantankerous, angry he's dude. He's still mad. He's like, still mad at you. What better? <laughs> you know. But in the end, the only people who tell you to do it better believe you can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm gonna take it. What secret writing tip of awesomeness did you discover the hard way? I'm okay. you have an answer for this. I, I did. I wrote this down. Um, the thing that I – now, again, I think this is related to sort of not identifying as a writer or telling anybody that this is sort of what I am and what I do. Um, <laughs> is that – this is going to sound really daft when I say it out loud. But, like, you can't get better at writing unless you do it a lot. Yeah. Which is like – it's a little bit embarrassing to say that that's something that I learned the hard way. We all come up to, on that, though. I think that there's just a lot of people right now who want to be writers who still haven't quite yeah. faced that. Yeah, like it's, you just can't get better at it unless you do it. Yeah. And you got to do it a lot. Like I, I like to think about things. I'm a dreamer and a fantasizer. And a lot of times that's very good. I can, I can, I, I have a 
pretty, I, I think I'm pretty good at taking weird ideas and like making them real. You are, but, like, yeah. Thank you. But like when it comes to, you know, I, I would think a lot about like how I would like to be as a writer, but it turns out that that amount of thinking is useless. If you're not actually writing. I think I did that for at least 15 years of my adult life. No. Yeah, because when I got my master's, I didn't really write again for seven years. Oh, I mean, I was that... always writing, but I was not finishing anything. I was just trying, you know. Did you traumatic and... experience in school? Yeah, or... the whole the whole MFA grad school critique model that left me trying to be this angsty great American writer, which, whereas really what I wanted to write were fun books about love and big books about sadness, but not the great American novel. And as soon as I let that go, it was better, but seven years of just not doing anything. Yeah. You know? Oh, so. yeah. Oh, anyway, perfect. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> how do you, and how do you refill your creative well? Oh, in all the ways. I, you in really do. Ways. I could actually probably list some of the ways you <laughs> refill oh, your it, creative do it, do well. It. Um, crocheting, trying new crazy things that you've never tried, pottery, um, your kid, going, going, playing with your kid. Um, that's what I got off the top of my head. But the trying, totally. you're, you're such a trier. And I do. I have become a trier. I was not always a trier. Yeah. It is like the single greatest thing about growing up to me, which by, by growing up, I mean sort of like in my late 30s, <laughs> is that I became a trier of all the things. But also like I love to sit and do nothing too. This, this, this is something that surprises people who like don't live in my house. It very much surprises um, me. Yeah. Like I, I am... Um, I know there's a lot of different weird internet words for what I am and I'm very gregarious, but also I need a tremendous amount of time to myself. And often that time is not doing anything. I like to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, that is doing something, but like I'm, I'm a consumer of things. I like to listen to the radio, mm -hmm. talk radio, um, specifically CBC Radio 1 mm -hmm. for you Canadians out there. I listen, I will uh, watch television. Um, like, tr like a ton. When, when I was writing mighty ugly in fact the the thing it's just very weird and twisted the thing i held over my head was that like to give myself a break i would watch one episode of the killing on netflix <laughs> which is like i love that show dark so dark <laughs> the most like like soul crushingly <laughs> dark show and i and and so darkness actually i think i i'm a pessimist i'm sorry i'm not a pessimist no i'm an optimist but darkness really fuels that like uh sort of I've, I've got to feel like I'm fighting for it I think like there are a lot of lazy optimists like I'm just going to speak platitudes and believe that the world is going to end up in rainbows like I don't believe that right I you know I like to go to the darkness and then I'm like no actually things are cool I <laughs> think I, that's one of the reasons I really really love you <laughs> is that that is exactly what I like. I really am the, the biggest optimist, but I also know that the worst things in the world happen with an alarming frequency. Yeah. So I like to go look at it, I like to touch it, hold it, and then walk away and have some iced tea on the back porch. Yes. You know? Like, like there is a quality of gratitude for mm -hmm. the simple things in life that comes from, right, memento mori. From, right, com right, right. Comes from just keeping in mind that we're all going to die maybe yep. tomorrow. Yep. Um, maybe today, you know, and that that's that's okay. And so that is very much at the heart of like, you know, I'm I'm somebody who works in like the super chipper crafts industry, and I do a project about making ugly things. Like this is all, like I I sort of <laughs> realized that I'm a very extremely consistent person. It just took me a very long time to be able to express the consistency with a bread that was like noticeable to other people outside my brain. Um, so yeah, so Netflix talk great like like I will just walk around the street I love to people watch I love to ride mm. the bus and stare out the window because then it's sort of like there's a you can't really notice a lot of details when you're just whizzing by mm -hmm. but I find that's a good combination of input and letting my mind wander so all of those kinds of things there will be big unproductive like non-productive times in my sort of like cycle of life and they will often involve a tremendous amount of consumption of media people watching, things like that. I love that. I love that. On really bad days, what other profession do you wish you had chosen? This was a shocker to me. Ooh, interesting. Question. Tell me. Because I was like, none. Which oh. either means I'm totally unmotivated. <laughs> or, sorry, another spit take. But like, <laughs> so so here's, here's what I've also realized. I love working as an editor. 
like the writing for me, one of the reasons I never said I'm a writer or I want to be a writer mm. is that it has always been a thing that I do. Even mm. if it was just for school, it was something that I took for granted I could do well. It was something that that has always been a medium through which I'm comfortable expressing myself. Editing is a skill and a profession that I learned. I was mentored. I learned a ton through experience and a ton through uh, experimentation. And like that clarinet magazine that you mentioned in my bio, yeah. I yeah. helped my client start. That was a guy who phoned me up one day after spending three hours on my website saying, I've got this crazy idea and I want to hire you to help me make it. And he was hiring me for skills that I had that I never thought I'd be able to use again. And so frankly, like if I sort of couldn't do this crazy artsy thing for a while and needed a structured job, mm -hmm. I would seek out an editorial position. Which is what you're still doing, like what you're saying. You're still doing it with your own work all the time, with his work. That's really, really awesome. It's kind of shocking to me to be like, wow, does that mean, I think what that means is like, happy. You did it right. I'm happy. I think that's what, I think that's what it means. You know, what does it even mean that I'm happy? What am I striving for? You guys, listen yeah. to her. This is, this is why I love Kim, honestly. Oh my gosh, we should just have our own podcast someday. <laughs> So wicked. Don't even start me on it because I, I will. Like I will. Sun. Okay. I can you give, can you give me a quick craft tip on something like revision or anything? Totally. So this comes from now. Okay, and I, I'd actually love to know what you think about this as a fiction writer, yeah. where you're reading in different voices and from different yeah. perspectives, right? Like I, not only do I prefer writing nonfiction, I prefer writing in the first person. I prefer writing as myself. Right. And the single greatest thing that I do, and I recommend this to even just bloggers all the time, right? Blogging is a form of nonfiction writing. Yeah. Uh, is to read it out loud. Yeah. Huge. And to revise as a, if you sound like a robot, you need more contractions in your writing, right? If you're saying, it is my pleasure to present to you my new knitting pattern, mm, it's is right. really important there, right? Like, and so, uh, and I, I read everything out loud. And for further tip, which is like, I even wrote this down in a parenthetical, <laughs> a lot of people tell me they're super stressed out about grammar and that a lot of people feel very awkward and hesitant to write anything that other mm. people will see because they feel like they don't know the rules. Mm -hmm. And so when you're reading out loud, when you pause, put in a comma. That's that's what I'm saying. That's like the comma has a history as a rhetorical device to indicate to a reader of something when you're reading it out loud to pause. Not a big giant pause, but just like, and time there was a breath. Comma. Yeah, yeah, time for breath. That's awesome. You know, and I've always I've always gone by that, and I've always had this very loose grasp on commas anyway. And then I just learned from a copy editor this year or last year. She's like, the reason you have a loose grasp is it is something that changes style-wise. Some editors are going to put in more. Some editors are going to take them out. Do what you want. It's not a big deal. Yes. I had this delicious experience with, like, with this clarinet magazine. I worked with a copy editor that I've worked with a lot who I met actually because she copy edited Make It Mighty Ugly. Oh, my gosh. And we've, we, like, we, we've become kind of pals. We've had coffee together. And so she copy edited the clarinet magazine. And then I worked with a proofreader I'd never worked with before. So, right? So for those of you sort of uninitiated, right, like the copy comes to me as the editor from the writers or from me. And I kind of get it into shape. I send it off to the copy editor who copy edits it. And then we goes to the designer. It gets all laid out in the magazine. And before it goes to print, it goes to the proofreader who makes sure that nothing is egregious in there. And the proofreader had some comma edits that were interesting to me because I didn't take all of the copy editors' comma edits because I was like, no, I get this. We're just, we're just gonna. I'm this gonna is my style. My yeah. way on here. <laughs> and yeah. so, it was it was so interesting to see, and I was actually it was something that I noticed about my experience with that was that I was very comfortable uh, doing that. There was no second guessing involved with me with which commas, which comma changes I accepted and which ones I rejected. I mean, I accepted most of them. That is uh, actually delicious. It is that super is the the whole stet idea, the idea right? of yes. stet. I have this. I have this. I will never do it, but I always want to get um, knuckle tattoos. One says stet, and the other says awk with a period. Awk. 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 You know what? That's what I should get. Like looking back at my my grade eight, Awk and like, verb. Clearly, it's the verbose. Like I just like, sort of like right here, like because I was thinking right. I've got this tattoo, and I and I was thinking of having qwerty tattoo. Oh, I right? love that. That's what I was thinking of doing. But now I'm like, you know, it would be way more personal. Awk. They're just like, verbose. <laughs> I just gotta have an 
exclamation mark and everything. Like, come on. <laughs> and what would you like to plug right now? I want you to talk, if you don't mind, I want you to talk about your uh, new Patreon because I am a supporter and I am so excited about you being on Patreon. Tell us all about it, please. Okay. So I recently, like a few days ago, launched a Patreon campaign because though we're sitting here, we're talking about writing and editing. I do a bunch of stuff for my work, um, actually very little of it in the kind of creative realm that has to do with writing or editing. I teach classes or I, I, I have harebrained ideas and I kind of corral <laughs> people into doing things along with me and trying new things. And, and I've been calling myself kind of like a camp counselor for grownups, channeling Perfect. that sort of comfort trying new things and immutable optimism into uh, seeing if, if people might pay me to provide those kinds of services. Yeah. And that's a weird thing to do and, uh, and, and a tremendous hustle. I mean, any kind of product development and selling is a hustle. Right. But, uh, you know, and I've, I've been aware of Patreon for a long time. I've supported you on Patreon Thank and you. a bunch of other people on Patreon. And I think it's a fantastic way. And I love seeing how each individual creator uses Patreon mm -hmm. to sort of support the best parts of their work. And so I got to thinking, what would I do? And the answer is kind of everything. And so I launched a Patreon campaign to, uh, to try to impose a little bit of predictable income onto my otherwise spur of the moment mm -hmm. type of creation. And though I did, it's like a soft launch, like I haven't even blogged about it yet. But the input that I've gotten from the few people who are my patrons so far are really giving me a shot in the arm like this is the right place they're like him we like the things that you come up with on the spur of the moment so just you know share just with us keep doing moment, yeah we want to see it right but it also the simple platform of patreon allows me to gather all of the things i want to do into one spot and give people the option mm. to participate in different kinds of ways so one of the things i have on my patreon is the option to join a small group of people and we'll have a private group and we'll go on kinds of creative adventures all together one, I think that would be fun for me, but two, I think that would be fun for other people and it would be the kind of place where people could get to know each other, form relationships, right? I'm a big fan of just the internet right. and relationships we can form, but all of the people in that group presumably wouldn't know each other, but would be interested in the same kinds of boundary pushing in their own creative experience, trying new things, getting better at what they do, sort of going on that whole kind of crazy ride and that as a thread that kind of brings everybody together, I think would be awesome. So so I launched this Patreon and then I said, well, I can have a goal. And one of the things that I have loved doing that I stopped doing because I couldn't justify it as a part of my business was podcasting. I loved your podcast. Oh, thank you. Compulsory. And you were on it. I was on it. Was it. Great. I didn't listen to that episode because I don't listen to my own podcast. Really? No, I mean, I listened to these to edit them, but oh God, yeah. no. Uh-uh. Oh, I loved it. It was great. It was great. And so so that's it. So I want to I want to be able to bring it back. And I had considered doing a Patreon just for the podcast when it became clear to me that I couldn't support it. Mm -hmm. um, but then that just was it was almost too specific. Mm. And it was really hard to think about what I would be able to deliver to people to my yeah. patrons beyond just a podcast episode. Right. And so what I love is that I, I, I think what I love about my great idea for the Patreon <laughs> is that I made it about all of my work and the podcast is a part of that work. And if I'm able to generate enough income every month by doing these cre harebrained creative things, then like an added bonus is that that means I would be making enough money from these crazy harebrained things to release, a, a, like to produce an episode of the podcast. Right. And so that's the idea. The really cool thing about Patreon is that, and I, and I love mine, it was one of the ways that I was able to, it was one step in my leaving my day job and going writing full time. But these little, I mean, like a dollar really matters. You don't think that it will, but, but you know, a bunch of people giving you one dollar or three dollars a, 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 an episode or a product every, every time, you, it changes lives, which is why I'm a patron of a bunch of people on Patreon too, because it really, really matters. It um, does. Okay. And before I forget, where is your Patreon located? Patreon.com backslash. Uh, yeah. Patreon.com slash uh, KP worker, K-P-W-E-R-K-E-R. -E -E Perfect. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, because I think you're really an expert on this and I didn't send you this question ahead of time, but I think one of your super powers is enabling people to get beyond, like push themselves beyond the fear of mm. trying something new. So is this something you're going to be going moving forward with on the on the Patreon and everything too, still pushing? Yeah. 
I think that's it's it's not even a push so much as a like it's cool. Yeah, it's, it's gonna right. be it's cool. It's not a push, right? It's a it's yeah. A, it, I think camp counselor is a really good way to describe <laughs> what you're doing because you're like, you. you know what, you got this. Just you do totally it. got exactly. What's the and worst the thing things... that can happen? It's ugly. Good Thank job. You. Totally, right? Can I tell you my book? I wrote a book about that in case it turns out ugly. No, but that's exactly it. It's that it's that there are loads of times in our lives when a when we're teetering on the edge of doing something terrifying and the consequences positive or negative can be huge and profound. Right. And the fear that we fear in that moment is very real and very valid and should help to inform whether we take the leap or pull pull back mm-hmm. and we want to make sure that whichever decision we make it's not a decision that on the balance of things we're going to regret right like that's really important when it comes to i've always wanted to learn how to weave yeah that that's not that kind of decision <laughs> that's just not that kind of decision that's me saying learn to weave what's the worst that could happen like you prick your finger with a dull needle no problem <laughs> right like you can rip it out again you, you're not even wasting yarn you can just whip, rip it out and do it again and so those kinds of things and I mean I, and I say this coming as somebody who didn't even consider myself to be a creative person until I was a grown-up because I was like I'm a daft fool so so that's like and I'm not saying this to be flippant or to downgrade the discomfort we have about doing those new things just that you know, it can be super fun and make you feel like a more resilient person when the fear is real and warranted if you stop feeling fear when it's not warranted and kind of embrace the imperfection mm-hmm. that is inherent in everything that we do. And I was like, I told this to my client when he found a typo in the 64 page magazine where I knew, right, this was on me. But I was like, you know what? It indicates the hand of the maker. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Nobody and there's no like... product without a typo. There is no None. product. Some of my books have gone through eight or nine different copy edit proof levels because of, you know, they're in Australia, they come to America. And even after all of those professionals have had their eyes on it, they there's still there's still typos in there. I don't if they're they're like the 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 mice that live in the walls. They just come out and eat yeah. at your letters. Totally. Yeah. Right, and it's it's never intentional, and it's never due to negligence. No, it's just human. It just happens. Yeah. And what keeps us interesting is that we're not perfect. And I lo- I I love that about what you do is that you really you. have made me more comfortable in that. That's why I did that whole drawing project last year I where I drew for that. 178 days or something before I finally realized, well, <laughs> I'm actually not enjoying this anymore. <laughs> But there's something so good about that. Like, yeah. that's never going to be something that gnaws at you. Like, yeah. what, if, what if I'm a secret, like, <laughs> drawer, right? Yeah. Now you Actually, know. I drew you. I remember <laughs> I just saw that as I was flicking through my Flickr account recently. That was a terrible picture, but thanks for letting me do I that. I loved it. I absolutely <laughs> loved it. I loved everything about it, including its imperfection. Yes, I loved it. Thank you, Kim. I cannot tell you how enjoyable it is to speak to you and how much I respect you as a creator and a maker. And thank you and a writer. And thank you for being on the show. Thank you. The feeling is totally mutual. And I will talk to you very soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.